In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged them. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz to bring some of the people of Israel to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. Among them were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. The king was angry and furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought to him. If you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning fiery furnace. Who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? And Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank, and God gave Daniel favor and compassion. Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Daniel blessed the God of heaven and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings. Tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. All right, well, good morning. Uh, welcome to the Door Church. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Darren Smith. Um, I am a non-staff elder and a member of the preaching and teaching team, and we are uh, very glad uh, that you're here with us today. Um, a little bit of an announcement. Um, on April 8th, we are going to have a, a day of fellowship after um, our time together. So go to thedoorchurch.net and you can get more details on that. But the Sunday after uh, Easter, uh, we'll, we'll plan to do that and, and to have some time together. Um, you have caught us near the end, uh, in, in nearing the end of a sermon series on the book of Daniel that we're calling Faithful Exiles. And today, um, our passage will be Daniel chapter 9, and our title is Daniel's Prayer. And um, uh, most, uh, most experts call this the most challenging part of Daniel and maybe even the Bible. So before we jump in, let's, uh, let's ask God to bless our time together. Lord, we come uh, to you today, and when we, when we open your word, um, we are uh, so honored but humbled um, at your majesty and your greatness, and that you would even dare to speak to us. And Lord, when we uh, look at this passage today, um, we are just reminded of our limitations, but we know that you are a great God. And so... Um, we pray that you would open our eyes to see what you see in our hearts, to know what you know. And Lord, um, through our imperfect words, would you speak to us today and make us like Jesus? In his name we pray, amen. Daniel is an awesome book. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed um, the, the time that we spent together as we've walked through it. Um, it is a book that is primarily... Um, about the sovereignty of God. And we've seen throughout Daniel that God reigns, he rescues, and he reveals. Now, the book of Daniel is a book that uh, details the captivity of the Israelites from Jerusalem and talks about their time in Babylon. And there they are faithful exiles. Now, Daniel chapter six can be divided, or Daniel can be divided into two sections. Um, really, verses or chapters one through six, and chapters one through six are very straightforward. They are um, chronological stories um, about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and it kind of just walks through on a timeline. And then we get to chapters seven through the remainder of the book, and the book takes what I would say is a great uh, plot turn. Um, chan ch seven through eight become uh, prophecy. And um, because of that, they are out of order. And so they, they don't go uh, chronologically. And when you get to chapters seven and eight, they really tie to chapter five and they predict the earthly kingdoms and an everlasting kingdom. And they talk about the comings of the Persians and the Greeks. And then we come to this great piece of uh, holy inspired literature, Daniel 9. And Daniel, Daniel 9 really corresponds to chapter 
6. So on the timeline, you can go back to chapter 6. You'll recall in chapter 6, that's the great story of Daniel in the lion's den. It's the first year of King Darius. Now, what's interesting is previous to this, Daniel has been able to interpret dreams and visions. And yet now we get to a point where Daniel can't interpret it. And he needs divine intervention to see what is happening. Now, as I mentioned, uh, this is uh, probably the most difficult passage uh, in, in all of the book. And so as I came to this, I couldn't think of anyone less qualified than me uh, to preach through it. Um, it, has, it has been very, very tough, but I think with the Lord's help, we'll go through it. I want to stress this as we jump into this. This uh, chapter is a story of God's redemptive promise, his love, his ultimate jubilee, and forgiveness. And so if we keep that um, as the center of our attention, we'll um, have a good understanding of this. And the main point of Daniel 9 is that sin has consequences, but that the grace of God will triumph. Sin has consequences, but God will triumph. And so we're going to just try to chop this into three uh, sections, three buckets, as we look at Daniel chapter 9. There's three things. Number one, repentance. We're going to see a strong theme of repentance in Daniel's prayer, and that'll take us through the 12th verse. And then the second point is rescue. So re repentance leads to God's rescue. That'll take us through verse 19. And then finally, uh, we'll wrap up the last seven verses with God's uh, revelation and what that means uh, to us today. So without further ado, let's jump into the passage. Turn with me, if you will, to Daniel 9. We're going to read uh, the first 12 verses. Daniel 9, verse 1, in the first year of Darius, the son of Asherus, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realms of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah, the prophet must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenants and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness. But to us open shame as to this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those who are near and those who are far away, in all the lands to which you have driven them, because of the treachery that they have committed against you, to us, O Lord, belongs open shame to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against him and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. He has confirmed these words which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity for under the whole heaven there has not been anything like what has been done against Jerusalem. And so in these first six verses, we find um, by now the old man Daniel who begins this great discourse, this great prayer to the Lord. I want you to sit with me for one minute in the captivity and the exile that Daniel um, has felt. You recall he was 15 uh, when he was taken captive about, and at this point, this is nearly 70 years later. I want to I put that in perspective for you. Imagine 
a man who was born in 1939 and was taken captive in 1954 and is still in captivity today. Born in 39, taken captive in 1954. That's the Eisenhower administration. And now today is still in captivity. That is what Jeremiah is facing. I'm sorry, what Daniel is facing. What he's doing is he's never giving up though, right? So he's continually reading about the prophecies about the exile and he's reading Jeremiah 25 verse 12. And if we had time, we would read that. And what that is saying is that the end is near because Jeremiah prophesies that the the exile will be 70 years. And what we find with the great prophet Daniel is that he has never forgotten to read those scriptures. He's never forgotten his identity. He is pleading for his people. He continues to beg for their forgiveness and for their mercy. If you were here when we studied Daniel chapter six, there was also a great discussion there about Daniel's prayers. And I want us to remember that this isn't about daily prayer time. This isn't about journaling. Certainly that would be included in a teaching like this, but what what Daniel is doing is fulfilling what King Solomon said to do in 1 Kings chapter 8. When they christened the temple, uh, King Solomon made this um, proclamation. He said, if we ever rebel against God and he ever takes us into captivity and we turn and face Jerusalem and we repent, then he will have mercy on us. And so Daniel is reading Jeremiah, he's remembering 1 Kings, and he is begging for the deliverance of his people. He is owning the consequence of of their sin. And perhaps we could preach a modern day sermon on on just that, is owning the consequences of our own sin. You know, um, so much of what we face is because of a broken world, and so much of the trials and, and, and trouble that we have is of our own doing, because of our own sin, and we have to sit in that and, and own those consequences that come our way. But then we see this idea that the Lord is righteous. The Lord is just and righteous. You see, the prophets had warned them. This wasn't um, God being quick on the trigger and just sending them off to exile. This had happened over and over again, and they had been warned, and yet they rejected God and his voice. They refused to listen to him. And so this exile that is coming to an end was a great demonstration of God's covenant faithfulness. He was fulfilling the warnings against Israel. This reminds me of being a parent, if you have children and you tell them there are consequences for certain action, you must fulfill those. If you don't, what you allow becomes the rule, right? And so when we look at this, the destruction and the deportation was just the outpouring of divine wrath. But hear me today, it was just and it was righteous And sometimes in our modern world, we sit back and we challenge God and we say, that doesn't seem fair. I don't think I would handle it that way. It's because we don't know the nature of a divine and holy and just God. You see, in in all of this, the Lord continues to be merciful. And the truth is that the exile was not even the full consequence of what God could have and should have done to them. But yet in all of this, he continued to show them mercy and he promises them rescue. And so we see the near end of this terrible calamity, but they must call on the Lord and wait for him. And so what do we learn today from this, this great prayer and this point of repentance? And I would say it's this, that God has always and still calls people to repentance. He's still calling us to repentance. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, the very beginning of, God, of Jesus' ministry, the Bible says, from that time Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Repentance is seeing sin for the way that it is, seeing yourself as a sinner. It's grieving it, it's turning, and it's rooted in a high value of God and not yourself. You see, you must see God as higher than you in order 
to repent. And this is perhaps one of the most countercultural teachings in our world today. We are taught that the self and the idealization of the self, who you want to be and what you want your identity to be is above everything else. It's not. Jesus is calling us to repent. And a little word about repentance. Um, There's two things that we need to be repentant of. The first is um, by being very bad. You know, you can run away from God by being very bad, by um, disobeying his laws and and, and discounting him and running away from him. And there may be some people here today that need to do that. But there's also a second way to repent. And that is from your very good deeds. The things that you think replace the atoning sacrifice and work of Jesus Christ. What I'm talking about here is self-righteousness and legalism. And we need to repent of the very good things that we do that replace Jesus Christ. You see, both of them are just self centered bits of idolatry. I love, I love what the great theologian um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said about this. He, he teaches us, he said to us that, um, you know, so many times I think we want the, the um, benefits of Jesus, but we don't want the broken heart that it starts with. We don't want all of those things. And he says this about grace for nothing. He says, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. No discipleship, no cross, no Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Jesus comes to us today and he says, repent. And he's here to break our heart and to give us a new heart. Because salvation is free, but it costs everything. And that moves us to the second point. In this, there's this great repentance, and then we see this great plea from Daniel in verses 13 and 19 for rescue. And the Bible says, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept ready the calamity and has brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous and all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and have made a name for yourself as is this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all your righteous acts, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your holy city, Jerusalem, your holy hill. Because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem, And all your people have become a byword among all those around us. Now, therefore, O God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy. And for your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see your desolations in the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, But because of your great mercy, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. And so we see a great plea for mercy. It's a corporate confession. He's begging the Lord for mercy again. Daniel has been there 70 years. He wasn't the one that got them exiled, and yet he bears that on himself. He sees that, and he's asking for deliverance, and he's hearkening back to um, uh, Egypt when the Lord brought his people out of Egypt, the great exodus. And you see, the Israelites here were helpless just like that, and they need that new deliverance. And this next part is really cool. It's beautiful. And in verses 16 through 18, we see Daniel, he's remembering Jerusalem. He's remembering that holy hill that God allowed the enemies and the Babylonians to smash. And he's praying that God would relent and turn his wrath, remove that judgment, restore, return. You see, when God allowed them to be taken into captivity, He allowed people 
to scorn his name. This was a big deal. This would have meant that Daniel's God was less than everyone else's God. It would have brought scorn. And vindication or delivery would have shown the might of God. It reminds me um, of the great story of uh, David versus Goliath. If you recall that story, the Philistines are camped uh, on one side of a valley and they would come every morning. Goliath would come and he would mock the armies of God and he would mock God. And so um, when David, a simple shepherd boy, uh, shows up and he hears all of this, notice his outrage. His outrage was, who is that guy who speaks against the Lord? You see, the, the injustice was that. And that's what's, what's happening here. And so when David is taunting Goliath, he says, I will defeat you today and you will know there is a Lord in Israel. And so by allowing them to go home, this would be um, a vindication of that. And Daniel prayed and he pleaded, but he needed God to turn and to hear. I love this. Israelites had no righteousness. Just like we have no righteousness. We don't bring things to God and he loves us because of that. And so Daniel knows that. And Daniel is saying like, we haven't done anything um, for you to deliver us. And yet we need that divine mercy. But to Daniel, this is about God and his city and his name. And so what do we learn from this today? Well, we need rescue and Jesus is our only hope. Colossians 1 verse 13 says, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. We've talked about this. When we say this title is called Faithful Exiles, it applies to Daniel, but it applies to us. Surely we must see ourselves rightly today. We are sinners. We are sinners facing the wrath of God, and we need repentance and rescue. Not only that, but those of us who have put our faith and trust in Christ we are not where we're supposed to be. This isn't our home. Everything that you know, your family, your houses, your job, your bank accounts, uh, your athletic accomplishments, your body, it's all passing away. This isn't where we were meant to be. And we are exiles, as Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2. And what that means is that we need a rescue. But I'm afraid today that sometimes we don't see it that way. Our our theology and our view of God is a low view of God, a low view of Jesus. We see Jesus as our co-pilot, right? He's my co-pilot. I have him on call. I'll call him when things get tough or when I can't handle it myself when I need him. But that is not the God of Daniel. It is not the God of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We aren't okay. We don't just need a wingman. We need a champion. And just like God sent a simple shepherd to deliver them from Goliath, he sends a shepherd to us to deliver us from the domain of darkness. The gospel says our situation is dire, but Jesus is not about giving us a second chance. He's about giving us a new life. And so we move from rescue into the third section, and that is revelation. And this is going to deal with uh, chapter, or verses 20 through 27. Y'all, this is going to get a little weird. So uh, buckle up. Here we go. Daniel 9, verse 20. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sins and the sins of my people, Israel and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God while I was speaking in prayer the man Gabriel whom I had seen in the vision at the first came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice he made me understand speaking with me and saying oh Daniel I have now come out to give you insight and understanding at the beginning of your pleas for mercy a word went out and I have come to tell you for you are greatly loved. 
Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood. And to the end, there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Well, uh, we've run out of time. So uh, thank you all for coming. Um, And I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Um, What an amazing prophecy Um, from, from, um, from the Holy Spirit. As we begin to look at this, um, there are um, several historic realities um, that I want you to keep in mind. And I'm going to try to move through these quickly so it doesn't become a long talk about history, but they are um, very important pieces for you to have top of mind as you consider the interpretation um, of these passages. Number one, you cannot divorce this section from the teaching of the Sabbath and the Jubilee. Um, So those of you who have heard of the Sabbath before, um, it is given in God's law in Deuteronomy 5 and Leviticus 25. Um, It is a big deal. We know that the Lord rested on the seventh day after creating the world. And after um, he delivered his people from um, Israel, as a reminder of the Exodus, he commanded that the seventh day be kept holy. And that, that day was a day of rest. And so every week there's a Sabbath. But then following that theme, every seventh year was a Sabbath. And on that seventh year, they were to allow the fields to remain untilled and planted. And that um, obviously is really good for agriculture, but it was also honoring to God and his work. And then every seventh year, so the 49 years, there was what they called the year of Jubilee. Now, the year of Jubilee was an even bigger deal. Not only did they allow all the land to rest, but it was a, um, a, a, a year of freedom and a proclamation that those um, who owed debts were um, somewhat forgiven. And so um, if you were an indentured servant, you were released and you were just supposed to go back to your ancestral homeland that God had given to the tribe. So even if you sold your land, it came back to your family at that moment. And it was this beautiful cycle of renewal and rejuvenation for God's people. We know that the exiles neglected it. Second Chronicles uh, chapter 36 says that part of the reason for the exile to Babylon was because they ignored it. And so the Lord says, I am going to give the land Sabbath for 70 years. So you don't want to take Sabbath? Well, now I'm taking the Sabbath. And that's what Daniel is seeing here near the end of those 70 years. I have to move quickly. After this is written, in about 538 BC, these exiles would be returned to Jerusalem. A few years later, Nehemiah um, begins to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. A couple of hundred years later, there's a man named Antichus Epiphanes who desecrates the temple. This is about 200 years before the time of Christ. It's a big deal in Jewish history. And then, of course, we know 
in 0 AD, Jesus was born. He lives, um, he dies, he's resurrected, and the church is established. A few decades later, in 70 AD, the Roman Titus would come to Jerusalem and totally destroy the temple. And that was the last time the temple would stand. And then finally, we know that time will end. We know that the Lord will return and make all things new. And so as we start to look at these next verses, keep all of those things in mind as we talk about the interpretations. Beginning in verse 20, there's an angelic visit. And what's really cool about this is that Daniel is praying at the time of the sacrifices that would have been made in Jerusalem. And we could preach an entire sermon on that. We don't have time. But the point here is that you can take Daniel out of Jerusalem, but you can't take Jerusalem out of Daniel. He's still remembering all of those things and he's still observing it. And I love this part and I don't want us to miss this. While he's praying before he's finished, Gabriel came in swift flight. When the Lord himself sends Gabriel, he is not messing around. A messenger from God in swift flight. And I love what he says. He says, I'm here to give you insight because you are truly loved. You are truly loved. Just like God sent Daniel an angel in chapter six in the lion's den, he sends an angel because he can see the stress that he has and he wants him to know that you are truly loved. And that is going to set the parameters for the rest of the interpretation that it's all about God's love for us. And I wanna just say one more thing and I have to move on. You, you are truly loved. God loves you. He loves you so much. I wish we could see it. You are truly loved. As we move into verses 24 through 27, the thing that I want us to recognize here is that at the center of this prophecy, there is Jesus. So if you read this, and you interpret it, and it's not about Jesus, you're doing it wrong. There's a lot of details, and there's a lot of different thoughts, and a lot of people tie all those historic things that we said to some of this imagery, but if you don't see Jesus, and you don't know that you're truly loved, you're doing it wrong. And so, we see that this is a difficult passage to understand. In fact, I would say the only agreement is disagreement. And surely there's room for brothers and sisters in Christ to disagree on the interpretation of this. One thing that is generally accepted is that the first 70 weeks uh, corresponds to the years in exile, right? So that 70 years is coming to an end. But from that point on, there are really three different ways to interpret this passage. One is what we might call a dispensational View. Now, these Christians believe that a large portion of this passage is dealing with the end times. They see this as prophetic. And so when they interpret these things, they think they are talking about things to come. The second way to review this is what we call a historic messianic view a historic view, including that of Christ. And so um, many of the, the Reformation leaders believed in this view, and they saw that the years listed here are literal, that um, Christ is the prince, that the prophecy was concluded, and that when it talks about Christ in these passages, he's inaugurating the kingdom. It's the beginning of the kingdom and the new covenant. And yet, there's another way to view this, and this is called the symbolic messianic. The symbolic messianic is kind of a combination of the two, but it shares a lot with the historic messianic view. They believe that instead of literal, the years are symbolic. Again, they see Christ as the prince, and they do believe that the prophecy is partially fulfilled, but that is still yet to be fulfilled in parts 
at the end times. And because of that, they think that's when Christ consummates the kingdom and the new covenant. And so in all of that, I would simply say this, Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecy. Regardless of where you fall or what you think, Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. And the two pieces of caution as you interpret this is number one, if he's not that, you're doing it wrong. And number two, if anyone ever tells you this is what it plainly says, you should throw a flag on the field and reconsider it. Because there's a lot of people who have charitable disagreements on this. But here's the point I want us to pull away from this. The revelation that points to Jesus Christ brings us great hope because we are greatly loved. It reminds me of what John the Revelator wrote when he saw heaven. In Revelation 21, 3, he said, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. When I was, um, when I was young, many of you have heard me say this, uh, I was raised in a very legalistic environment. I was, um, I was taught that salvation was Jesus plus my good works. And so um, for that, um, I thought that Christ would save me, but maybe uh, when I was judged, uh, I would need to just get the ball over the goal line. Um, I think that's a good way to say it. And so um, there was only one problem with that. It was that I wasn't very good at getting the ball over the goal line. And so when, when I would think about revelation and end times and I would think about judgment, I was always afraid. And it's still a fear I have to fight. And yet what this passage is teaching us is that you are greatly loved The intent of this passage is to give us hope. We need a jubilee. We need the release. We need freedom. And that comes with Jesus Christ. And so when we fear or where we dread, we aren't seeing God and his love for us rightly. It's a misunderstanding of him and his glory. But when Jesus is the center of this prophecy, when he's the center of it all, in the end, he's on the throne and he wipes away tears. He undoes all the injustices and the evil and all the sad things. And so this revelation and every revelation that we read as Christians should cause us to proclaim what John says in Revelation 22. At the end of it all, he says, even so, come, Lord Jesus, make it all right. Daniel 9 is an awesome but very difficult chapter. Sin has consequences, but God's grace will triumph. He's calling us to repent. He's bringing us rescue, and he is revealed to be on the throne, and that should give you great hope. And so today I just want to conclude with one final passage from the book of Isaiah which was a prophecy about our Lord Jesus. It says in um, chapter 61, beginning at verse one, the spirit of the Lord God is on me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive and freedom to the prisoner, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of our God's vengeance to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, festive oil instead of mourning, and splendid clothes instead of despair. And they will be called righteous trees planted by the Lord to glorify him. The same God that delivered Daniel and his people is the same God that loves you and delivers you. Will you pray with me? Lord, as we uh, conclude uh, these thoughts uh, this morning again, we are are so humbled. Um, We are humbled by the fact that you have given these to us, that you would um, come to us and share this great revelation with us. And Lord, as we, we do look at it, we pray that you'd give us a spirit of humility. 
Lord, we, we repent this morning. We repent of um, our evil deeds and then the deeds that we think look good to you. And we know they're not. And we know it's like filthy rags. And, and Lord, we, we pray that your Holy Spirit would convict us and that we would turn from this and turn our face to you. Lord, we, um, we need rescue. We need rescue from our sins and our weaknesses, and we need rescue from this world where we are exiles. Lord, we, we beg you to deliver us. We have no hope but you. We have no one to champion us but Jesus, and we pray for that. And Lord, we finally thank you for your great revelation that you love us and that throughout time, Jesus is a steady and solid rock and that history is based on him and his return and us being with you forever. Lord, we, we love you and we need you. We beg all of this in Jesus' holy name, amen.